Shalom this morning. Welcome to the Bible study. We are in the book of Jeremiah chapter 21 as we continue. If you have not yet read chapter 21, please stop the video right now and do so and then join us once again. If you haven't yet subscribed and you'd like to be part of the Bible study, please send us an email at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we will send you a link. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please subscribe and press like. That will get people to come and join us as well and be involved in our Bible study here and in the future. As customary, 25 minutes into the study, and then Bob Mendelson, the head of Jews for Jesus, will obviously be teaching us as we take notes and glean from this word and the truth of the word of God as spoken by Jeremiah and hear what God has to say. And then what we'll do is invite you back for a Q&A. That should be fun too, so we can glean some of the truths and apply them, of course. Now, without further ado, please, Bob Mendelson, thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning as we unpack chapter 21 of the prophet Jeremiah. We'll dig into it and find out what God has to say to us as 21st century people, wherever you live, and for those on YouTube who are watching us later from wherever and whenever you are watching. If you are on YouTube and you haven't yet read the chapter, please pause your playback, read chapter 21 of Jeremiah, and then rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. Today we encounter Jeremiah encountering another man named Pashkur. We met one Pashkur last week, but this is another one. How do I know that? They have different fathers. Uh, that's pretty easy. And this Pashkur is an emissary from King Zedekiah, along with another man named Zephaniah. The king, Zedekiah, has a question and thinks Jeremiah might have the answer. That's a great position for the prophet to be in. He is a trusted spiritual advisor to the king. And I'm sure he wants to bring a good report to the king. And the king wants to hear good things from the prophet. So it's a setup for good. But for those of us who have been faithfully studying and reading this prophet's words, you probably know what's coming next. Sure enough, the prophet smells a setup for wrong and fake news and begins to warn King Zedekiah that all his efforts for victory will fail and that Babylon will conquer the people of Judah. We'll unpack this section and see if there's any hope extended either to the people of his own day or to the exiles who would read this prophecy, say, a hundred years later, or indeed as should be for us who are reading this two and a half thousand years later. Where is your hope? First, the king asks for spiritual guidance, verses one and two. Verse 1, we see Zedekiah, that was the final king to whom and under whom Jeremiah prophesied. He actually was the last king, so this beginning of the litany of kings is not chronological. Remember, this scrapbook of recollections is a rewrite, in this case out of order, as we will see in 15 chapters from now. So why start with the final king? written in 588 BCE or so, I think to highlight the ultimate message, to see the faintest and final hope of the Jewish people in light of, or rather in the darkness of, final judgment, which is coming. The king lasted about 10 years. He was weak, both militarily and spiritually. In 2 Chronicles 36 and Ezekiel 17, write those down, 2 Chronicles 36, Ezekiel 17, uh, King Zedekiah had refused to pay tribute, that's money, uh, to Babylon. And he had actually sought help from the other superpower militarily of the day, Egypt. Neither of those geopolitical actions were helpful so he turned to spirituality, as desperate people often do. He sent word to the prophet Jeremiah. Why? 
He hoped that Jeremiah would bring signs or miracles or, or wonders like God had done in the past, specifically using the term used in the Exodus story. Uh, Niflotav, it says, wonders, your wonder, his wonders. Maybe he'll do his wonders. It comes from the word Pele, like you've seen in Isaiah chapter 9. The same word used of the son who would be born or given to us. It's God's action word about himself. He does Pele. He does wonders. Zedekiah is hoping God will act on his own behalf and therefore on our behalf to save us from doom. But God, calling on the God of the Exodus without the understanding of covenant stipulations, is mockery. God saves our people in Egypt so that we would represent him, not so that we could employ him. Christopher Wright, some of you know I read his commentaries on both Jeremiah and Deuteronomy, uh, says of this, quote, It was precisely this kind of arrogant complacency, uh, thinking God was at their beck and call, that God would always keep Jerusalem safe that Jeremiah had attacked in his temple sermon in chapter 7, end quote. You see, if God is the God of the Exodus, then we must be the people of the Exodus, and then, of course, the people of Sinai. You want God to perform? Great. What's your performance in response? What's the evidence of Judah's performance? That's what Jeremiah has been proclaiming and decrying for 21 chapters. God should not be our last resort. He should be our first port of call. We should give him the first portion of our lives, the first portion of our day, the first of our weeks, the first of our money. We should remember him early, not last. Zedekiah is representative of those who finally turn to God but really are not even turning to him at all, but the run out of options people who think God might be a possibility, not the one who makes all things possible. He's not the relegated. He's the real one who requires us to bow the knee from our own choices, not from final option. Some of you will remember being in primary elementary school and perhaps being not so athletic. Two athletic captains were chosen in recess to play a game on the playground, and then they'd slowly choose through the list of people who put up their hands to play the game. And there you and little Johnny were the last ones left, and you were the last one chosen. You remember that one? You weren't really chosen at all, were you? Okay, we'll take Tim, I guess. The final choice isn't really a choice. It's fatal agreement, but not choice at all. That's how God is feeling about himself with Zedekiah. They say there are no atheists in foxholes, and that might be the same feeling. Christopher Wright says of this request, quote, to ask the man whose words from God they put so persistently ignored now to entreat that same God on their behalf was as crass as it was callous, end quote. Second section today, verses 3 to 7, Jeremiah pronounces judgment again. The king, Zedekiah Tzadok Yah, that is, God is my righteousness, is going to cop it and he's going to hear it back from his emissaries whom he sent. Can you imagine? That's not going to be a pleasure for Pashkur, who, this is the second one, remember. Last week, the Pashkur had Jeremiah put in stocks and beaten and kept overnight. This Pashkur will have Jeremiah dumped into the stinking pit, uh, like a royal prison in chapter 38. We'll see that. Remember, there's no email, there's no fax service, there's no letters. Pashkur had to return himself to the king with the message from Jeremiah. And he was really angry about this message and the whole situation itself. 
not only would God pronounce judgment on the people and reject the king's request, in fact, God would work with the enemy to make sure this judgment occurred. What? God is not on our side? Well, look at verse 4. What does it say? I'm about to turn back, God says. I will gather them. Verse 5, I myself will do this. Yikes. It's one thing when God turns his back and says, whatever to the cries of his people. I'm done with those folks. But it's quite another when he says, you're on the wrong team. You've lived wrong. I'm the quarterback of the other team. I'm going to war against you. But that's exactly what we read here. I'm going to read from verse 4. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to turn back the weapons of war which are in your hands, with which you are warring against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside the wall, meaning the wall of Jerusalem. And I will gather them into the center of this city. I myself will war against you with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. Hmm. Even in anger and wrath and great indignation. I will also strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They will die of a great dever, a great pestilence. Then afterwards, declares the Lord, I will give over Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people, even those who survive in this city, from the pestilence, the sword, and the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their foes, and into the hand of those who seek their lives, and he will strike them down with the edge of the sword. He will not spare them, nor have pity, nor compassion. And did you hear any words that sound like they came from other scenes of Jewish history? Words like, Biadnetu ya, uvizroa chazaka, outstretched arm, mighty hand. Yeah, those are words right out of the Passover story. That's how God delivered our people from Egypt, with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. And now the God who did that a thousand years previously about 1500 BCE, okay, is going to use those very weapons in his own arsenal against his own people. That's got to hurt. That's got to hurt the loving nature of Almighty God. He's not happy about this. He longs to use those arms and hands to enwrap us, to embrace us, to love and guide us. I watched this the other day with one of my grandsons who fell and hurt himself. And my wife was, she was there faster than I think he fell. And she wrapped her arms around him. And I thought, that's exactly the nature of God. This tender sweep up, caring. I really enjoyed watching that. I, I was slower. God wants to love us. He wants to guide us. He wants to enwrap us. But we refused. We turned away from him. We slapped his arms away, and what is his option at that point? You see, God loves us enough to give us free will. He wants love to characterize our relationship together. But if we walk away, if we spit on his name, if we reject his goodness, what is his option? To make us his own? To make us name him as sovereign? He doesn't desire robots. He wants children who love and adore him because he's worthy of our love. Some people you might have talked to who say that everybody's going to go to heaven one day. But heaven is a place of the worship of the Almighty God. And if you don't trust, love, and adore him, you don't want to be with him, what kind of heaven is that if you go and worship God in whom you don't believe? Other Passover words are here, like dever, meaning pestilence, remember one of the ten plagues, and anger and wrath, pestilence, sword, famine. These are all deliverance words. That is, words that God used and actions God took 900 plus years previously to deliver the Jewish people. Now he will use those same actions against us. 
imagine for a moment if you are Jeremiah at that point. You're, imagine being Jeremiah at the moment. Imagine having to send this note through the two emissary messengers back to Zedekiah. We know already that Pashkur will seek his life. Zephaniah, the other one, who, well, he'll eventually be taken to Babylon and executed. Imagine Jeremiah's heart breaking as he speaks these painful words. I want you to feel this. You see, if you tell people, people in your own sphere of influence, in your own neighborhood, or even in your own family, that they're going to hell, that their sin is abundant, and if they don't repent, they'll be lost forever. Okay, those words may well be true, but if your heart doesn't break as you say it, if you don't have a Jeremiah feeling, if you don't care and wish you didn't have to speak those words, then you're missing the boat. Judgment is the penultimate action of a loving God. Mercy is his desire. He longs to have a relationship with us and to keep us in his kindness and mercy. Yes, judgment is coming. Yes, penalties accrue to us who reject him. The old adage of father with switch saying, this is going to hurt me more than it will hurt you is true to those who know the heart of the Almighty. Amen. This prophecy does eventuate. Jeremiah spoke these words around 588 BCE, as we've said, and the siege from Babylon came just about then and lasted for 30 months, two and a half years, until Tishabah of 586 BCE, about mid-July. Zedekiah the king, along with his family, was captured along along with uh, the nobles. <laughs> this is horrible. Zedekiah's sons were killed before his own eyes. I can't imagine that. Then the king was blinded and sent to Babylon where he died. It's a terrible ending on so many levels. We in Australia are going to have an election this weekend. Although millions of Aussies have already voted, I'll submit my votes this afternoon. Government matters, and godly government matters even more. What are the responsibilities of government? To protect their own people, and to especially care for those who cannot speak for themselves. Standing against power, standing against pseudo-relevance and defending the needy and doing justice. That's the role of biblical government. That includes taking care of homeless and those without family. That's the poor. That's the needy. Chris Wright says, quote, the primary test of the moral legitimacy and credentials of any government is how it acts on behalf of the poorest and neediest in society, end quote. If you haven't yet voted, please remember that as you do. Finally, verses 8 to 10, I know it's not the final section of the chapter, but it is this final section on which I'm going to comment. And yet there is hope. One of the realities I ever see in the Jeremiah prophecies is the notion of hope. Here it is extended again, not to the nation, but to individuals. The country is lost. People are going to go into exile. Government will fall. People will die. And yet. And yet God is still offering us hope. The hope for the people of Jeremiah 21 is to surrender to the invading armies and go off to Babylon. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. Jerusalem is our home. It's the holy temple. God lives here and it represents God's rule on earth. We can't abandon that, can we? What Jeremiah predicted must have sounded like treason to the people. Give up, go into exile. Uh, we were captive and slaves in Egypt a millennium ago and God delivered us. We should now go back? And yet that's exactly what he's telling the people to do and to listen to this binary choice. 
Again, it's taken, or so it seems to be taken, from Torah. Torah ends with Deuteronomy, with the swan song of Moses. You might remember that. And as Torah ends with these words of Moses to the people, he's declaring in his swan song, they're going to walk away from the Lord. They're going to fail God. <laughs> That's a great ending. As he pronounced, that was sarcasm. As he pronounces their judgment to come, he reminds them this in Deuteronomy 30, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing, sorry, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. The reality of our failure is clear. Witnesses called and that have addressed the court and the defendants and yet. The offer of choice is still there. Choose life, blessing, not cursing. The evidence is not in what we say so much as in what we do. Will we now individually live for God? Will we extend kindness and goodness to the less fortunate? Will we live like covenant people, not trying to earn our righteousness, but declaring tzadokia, that is, my righteousness is the Lord? Will we care for the needy and the poor? My friends on this Zoom call today, or those watching on YouTube later, if you hear his voice, turn to him and repent. Find grace to help and mercy in your time of need. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's armies are coming to Jerusalem. The time of trouble is upon Judah. There's no escaping. But for those who turn to the Lord and repent, for those who listen to his voice, to those who agree with his lordship and say yes, there's personal forgiveness, there's joy. God longs for us to respond. He longs for us to love him. Don't make him your last choice. Make him your choice just now. Jimmy, let me turn it back over to you, my friend. Thank you, Bob, for that lesson. We appreciate you so much. Listen, it's at this time that we give you an opportunity. If you do not yet know Yeshua as your Savior, please take a moment right now in your own words, right wherever you are, ask him, call upon God, and he will deliver you. He promises to do just that. He is still in the business of delivering those that are caught and ensnared in sin and in idolatry and in darkness. Come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light today. Just ask him and he promises to deliver you. So in your own words, wherever you are, please pray. Lord, help me. I don't know how to get out of this. I need to get out of this. I want to get out of this. Would you save me today? Would you put your peace and your comfort and your joy in my life? I've been so depressed. Can I get life from you today? I've heard that you've done it for others. You can do the same for me. If you've prayed and asked God in your words where you are right now, please let us know at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we will send you some literature. We will stand with you in prayer. We will just thank you and invite you to continue to pray with us and for you because you are part of God's family now. So please let us know at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au. And of course, brothers and sisters, don't forget next week, chapter 22 of the book of Jeremiah, as we continue to the finish line, 52 chapters. Thank you, Bob Mendelssohn and Shabbat Shalom. See you next Friday.